Hey gents, a constant refrain I hear about fashion brands, in particular the mall brands like J. Crew, Banana Republic, Johnson Murphy, Gap, and the others, is that their quality has gone downhill or that it's not the same as it used to be. I see this in my YouTube comments and MFA forums, and it's everywhere. I'm going to give you a very detailed explanation on why this is happening, but first a more broad one. The perceived consumer value of clothing has deteriorated in the last 15 years. There was a rise in off-price retailers like TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and those type of companies. And then at the same time, in 07, 08, the recession hit, which really hurt brands, while at the same time, there has been middle-class wage stagnation, which has hollowed out specialty retailers, leaving some winners up in the luxury space. Those brands are doing pretty well. And then a huge rise in the lower price retailers, like your Kohl's, your TJ Maxx and Marshalls. And all this is happening while at the same time, there is the greed of Wall Street and the constant need to show shareholder value and growth. Is that it? So let's look at what happened in the last 10 years, in particular with the mall brands that I no longer shop at. The 80s and 90s was the rise in the mall, in particular specialty brands. Once a brand like J. Crew gained a little bit of traction, they'd go public, raise a bunch of money, open new stores each year, and be able to show that they've been growing, and everyone is happy. Then you had brands that were already established in the late 90s, early 2000s, like Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, Nautica, and many of the brands you see in the Macy's and GJ Maxx today, they hit a tipping point where they needed the distribution of stores to show top line growth, and they leveraged their brand equity to sell clothing at lower prices, and to do it, they had to lower the quality of the clothing. The early 2000s is also when you start to see a lot of traction in off-price retailing like Marshalls, TJ Maxx, and Steinmart. So now let's roll back to the focus on specialty brands. If J. Crew wants to bring an item to market, let's say this blue crew neck sweater that sells for $49, the steps to bring that item to the store start more than a year before it goes on sale. There's the concept, design, raw material sourcing, sampling, production, distribution, sales, and that is the supply chain. There's also returns and discounting on top of that, but we'll touch on those later. Think about the number of stores that J. Crew has, about 280, and they need enough inventory in each store so they don't run out, multiplied by the number of sizes, so for quick easy math, Let's say in the average store, they're going to send 20 items of the SKU, five in each size, so they're sending 100 items to the store, and at an all-in cost of $25 each, which includes the materials. So in this case, J. Crew is gambling $700,000 on a single item before they ever know that it will sell. Multiply that by the number of styles they bring out each season, and you can see that one bad item is going to cost a lot of money. But if it's a hit, they're made in the shade. So this is the needle that brands are trying to thread every single day. Too much, too little, and making sure they hit that sales target. So why is the quality declining in these brands? Well, let's go back to that recession in 2008. This provided a springboard for off-price retailers. Specialty stores in particular were hurt in their full price business, but their outlets started gaining a lot more traction. Previously, outlet stores were a way to get rid of old inventory, but as I talked about in this video I'll link to, now products are made at a cheaper price point to be sold as a deal in those outlet stores. So again, they're leveraging the brand's equity, but that is very short-term thinking. So let's go back to that sweater that I was talking about. It retails for $49 and in a pre-recession world, when J. Crew was really booming, they were actually using some of the nicest raw materials they could source. The raw materials on this garment cost them about $18, and they knew that they could make enough margin on that sweater because it would mostly sell at $49, which is the average unit retail. After 2008, they start to train customers to expect 30 to 40% off. So now, people aren't going to pay $49 for that sweater, and after one or two seasons, J. Crew needs to adjust so that they aren't underwater on style. And remember, these companies are not dumb. It's like people that think that they're outsmarting credit card companies when there are whole teams of PhDs and data scientists that are engineering products to get more of your money. I mean, yes, the points guy is doing well, but that's a very small fraction. So back to the sweater. If J. Crew is starting to see the price resistance at $49, they understand that the AUR of their sweaters is now closer to $30. So they're going to start producing products that can still make the money at the lower AUR. That means that when they're sourcing raw materials, instead of getting high gauge, long staple cotton for the sweaters, they'll start to get lower gauges so they can now spend $8 on raw materials 
which the sweaters don't last as long, don't feel as good, but they need to make money while giving consumers the perception that they're getting 40% off the full price. This is a simplification, of course, and there's definitely gems you can find in outlet stores or at TJ Maxx and Marshalls, but you can see the chicken and egg problem that retailers are facing between trying to let customers think they're getting a good deal, continuing to grow sales, but also continuing to make money. It's tough for them to raise prices, especially with competition now in the direct to consumer space with brands positioning themselves as high quality goods at fair prices, and they need to continue to show investors in Wall Street that they are growing. The only modern example of a brand that I know of that has kind of made this turn is Coach. Many years ago, they overextended themselves, they heavily diluted their brand with too many outlets, discounts, and sales, and they pulled all that back to reposition the brand, and they're at the tail end of it. Let me know if any modern brands are making this turn now, because I love to follow this stuff, but the alternative path for brands is to do something like these heritage brands, like Red Wing, Thoroughgood, or Turnbull and Asser, where they're just good businesses that never really shoot up as high as some of the big ones, but they also never go bankrupt like many of the retailers did that we saw in 2017 and 2018. The reality in the internet era is a direct consumer is a superior business model. Their cost structures benefit the product, the consumer, and the company. Most of them talk about cutting out the middleman to deliver the highest quality goods at good prices, and there's definitely efficiencies of not having stores and managing inventory, and then shipping costs that they pay are a fraction of the impact that brick and mortar stores have on the bottom line, especially when it comes to the thousands of frontline retail employees it takes to staff these stores. With retailers the size of Gap, H&M, or Zara, 70 to 80% of the workforce is just within the stores. But it's been well proven by brands like Bonobos, Everlane, or Warby Parker, is even if you are starting out online and you are direct to consumer, you still need some form of store to reach the most customers possible. So in a nutshell, consumer price resistance drove down AURs, which pushed down raw material costs, but they kept inflated full price tickets, which hurts the perceived value of a product and therefore the brand. So there you have it, hope you enjoyed that one. I know I cover a lot of menswear brands and I had mentioned menswear specific brands in this video, but the exact same thing is happening in the women's world, which to a larger degree because there are more women's brands. And so I will link down below to more videos in this, I call this my industry series, where I take a look at the, the industry as a whole, not necessarily at the product level like I typically do. And if you like this stuff, let me know because that helps me to continue making videos like this. Until next time, gents, this is The Cavalier. <laughs> <laughs>